So I'm going to speak um, about in vitro growth of uh, the most immature stage of follicle. And just to recap in terms of how eggs are formed within the human ovary, we have the formation of the ovary um, before birth, so during fetal life. We have the primordial germ cells. They're migrating to the gonadal ridge and then forming in clusters and then the um, becoming oocytes when they enter uh, meiosis and then they get to uh, prophase one, the dictate stage of prophase one, and then they're arrested. And they're forming associations with uh, somatic cells, the granulosa cells, to form the store of primordial follicles. And at birth, all females would have a store, uh, a pool of these primordial follicles. And it's after birth that these would be um, uh, utilized. So they'd be uh, used to um, uh, maintain the, the fertility uh, after, after puberty. But follicles are initiated to grow as, almost as soon as they're formed, but obviously not all of them grow. So many of them are in this uh, quiescent phase, uh, stage and they are waiting for signals for them to start to develop where the oocyte increases in size. The granulosa cells are proliferating to form the um, multilaminar stage, the preantral stage. And then we see this morphogenetic transition with the formation of an antral cavity and then the uh, differentiation of the granulosa cells into the mural granulosa cells and the cumulus granulosa cells surrounding the oocyte. And then the, the formation of the pre-ovulatory um, follicle. So this is a complex process. It's a, a process that involves many uh, positive and negative um, control factors. And what we've been interested in, as David said in his introduction, for many, many years, is being able to grow these eggs, these uh, primordial follicles, entirely outside the body to a point where they can be matured and fertilized. And we've been looking at this in a, in a range of species for a number of years, and we're now focusing on, on human. So this is the process then of in vitro gametogenesis or uh, in vitro growth, IVG, and we've been looking at both the development of the most immature stage, and remember 99.9% .9 of these immature eggs are destined to die, so we're looking at developing them in vitro, and we've also been looking at the formation of eggs from stem cells. So recapitulating this process, starting from the most immature stage, is incredibly complicated. So you have to support the oocyte develop, development and the surrounding somatic cells, the surround, somatic, uh, the, the um, ovarian granulosa cells. So how are we going about it then? Well, in the first stage then, um, it, it, that, that's, that's kind of given us hope to pursue this in other species, is that immature oocytes from primordial follicles have been grown entirely in vitro in a mouse model. And this was first done in 1996 at the Jackson lab, in John Epic's lab. And at that time, only one mouse was um, uh, born through the, after the in vitro growth of primordial follicles, in vitro maturation and subsequent fertilization. And this was Egbert. And Egbert was not a, a healthy mouse. So uh, people made the assumption that it was because he was derived from an in vitro grown oocyte. And of course, there really was no evidence to support that. But the reality is in the EPIC group, they um, uh, modified their culture conditions. And subsequently in 2003, they were able to produce many offspring and the offspring have been healthy with some slight differences in terms of uh, blood pressure but they seem to be healthy um, individuals. Recently, there has been uh, the generation of fertile oocytes from primordial germ cells in vitro and induced pluripotent stem cells. But I'm not going to focus at that stage. We're just focusing on in vitro uh, growth of primordial follicles. 
So this is uh, really applicable to the human situation from a clinical perspective because of the development of the field of fertility preservation and restoration. And this was uh, initially developed in Edinburgh where uh, ovarian biopsies can be taken from women prior to them undergoing a chemotherapy or other damaging treatments that, that would be damaging uh, to the ovary. They can uh, take the, the tissue and then cryopreserve that tissue. And these are the, the sort of ovarian strips that uh, are taken from the cortex containing predominantly primordial follicles. And these uh, strips can be then transplanted um, back to women when they're, they're well enough. And we know that now that there's over 150 live births through this transplantation process, we're not entirely sure of the exact number, but it's growing all the time. Now, there's a problem, though, uh, sometimes with uh, transplanting uh, the tissue. So although the um, fertility might be preserved through cryopreservation, in some cases, the tissue cannot be transplanted because it could risk reintroducing malignant cells to the woman. So clearly, there would be no transplantation. So what can you do in, in these cases? Well, the group of uh, Jacques Donné, Marie-Madeleine Dolmans and Christiane Amarini have been uh, looking at developing artificial ovaries where they isolate follicles of all stages and remove any potential malignant cells and then embed them within a matrix and the idea is that that could then be transplanted back. Now of course that you know carries risks because uh, you're absolutely 100% sure that there are no malignant cells. So it's also led to the development of being able to grow the immature eggs that are contained within these strips out with the body so entirely in the lab and that would avoid the transmission of any malignant cells. So that's what we've been working on for a number of years. And uh, I'm just highlighting here that the tissue freezing um, was developed in Edinburgh and it was, it's actually been in clinical practice in Edinburgh since 1994. And it's now available, it's, it's being used in centres um, throughout the world. And New York, in New York, there's, there's uh, many programmes of ovarian um, tissue freezing. So these frozen thawed of human ovarian cortical strips contain predominantly primordial follicles, as you can see. Now, this is a case of where there have been some abnormal cells uh, detected in the prepubertal patient, and this tissue would not be uh, transplanted. And for prepubertal patients, it's incredibly important that we try to work out uh, ways of growing these eggs because they have no other option for fertility preservation other than the cryopreservation of the uh, cortical strips. So if it cannot be transplanted, then they have lost the ability to restore their fertility. So we have a challenge then to develop these immature oocytes entirely in vitro to the point where they can be matured and fertilized. So how are we going about it? Well, we're looking at optimizing the growth of primordial stages, the activation, and then uh, isolating growing follicles and growing them further, and then focusing on the oocyte and looking at the final stages of oocyte development. And then, of course, we want to test their function, the meiotic capacity, and their fertilization uh, potential, and whether indeed they're normal. So what we work with, we work with um, ovarian tissue that comes from healthy women at the time of caesarean section. We work with uh, tissue from fertility preservation, various cancers and Turner syndrome, and uh, tissue that's been chemotreated. And we have a range of ages from very young, uh, 15 months to uh, 45 years. And we have the ability to look at tissue that's uh, freshly isolated and compare it to the cryopreserved tissue. And we've also recently been working with transgender patients and at that time we get whole ovaries when they're undergoing their gender reassignment surgery. And I'll mention some of the results that we have with the transgender patients um, uh, later on. 
So my clinical collaborators are Richard Anderson, um, who's a gynecologist and runs fertility preservation here in Edinburgh. Uh, Hamish Wallace is a pediatric oncologist, and Neil Watson is involved in the uh, gender reassignment patients. So the, what we start off with then is a microcortex, and the, the, the key point in terms of activating the growth of primordial follicles is to prepare the tissue in the correct way. So we have to remove much of the underlying um, stroma, and we have to prepare small pieces of cortex that are more or less flattened. We remove the, any larger follicles, and then we uh, suspend the microcortex with the free floating cultures in a basic serial free media that contains a very low dose of um, uh, FSH and um, it has uh, the human serum albumin and ascorbic acid um, as a, a free radical um, inhibitor. And what happens when we uh, prepare the tissue in this way? we see activation of these follicles. We see them um, rather quickly. Um, within six to eight days, we can see growing follicles. And when we see these growing follicles, we can then take them, remove them by micro dissection. We do not use enzymes because enzyme damages the growing follicles, it damages the thicker layer that we want to keep intact. So we isolate these follicles and we um, grow them for a further period, and then this is uh, our step two in our isolated follicles. And these follicles are not embedded in any matrix, no alginate, no collagen, nothing. They're, they're simply suspended within a V-shaped well, and that retains their three-dimensional configuration, and they form multilaminar structures um, after uh, they've, they've, they've been um, grown and they also form antral cavities. So you can see here um, after our uh, step one and step two that you will see the formation of antral cavities um, in these in vitro grown follicles. And the essential or the key to um, having healthy follicles within this stage of culture is to ensure that you're maintaining the communication between the oocyte and the granulosa cells and the granulosa cell communication. And David Albertini, who's chairing this session, has done a lot of work in this uh, communication network. And you know he's absolutely an expert on this. And we've worked with David um, to look at various factors that will promote the connections during um, in vitro development. And we've um, published work that shows the presence of activin is essential to maintain this structure, and also it's essential to ensure that you don't have too high a dose of FSH, because then you start to disrupt this uh, communication network. And we've published with David uh, on, on this uh, process. So we have these antral follicles, and we uh, what we want site development. Now our strategy has been to not grow the antral follicle to be larger and larger as it would be in the body, because in the body it has an endocrine role, so it needs to be very large to secrete the estrogen to get through the body and have an effect. We are interested in this part the oocyte and its surrounding somatic cells. So rather than grow the whole structure, we took the approach that was really quite similar to the EPIC approach in the mouse model, where we removed the oocyte and its surrounding granulosa cells and then cultured it on these membranes for a further period of time to see if we could get further oocyte development. And what happens is when we grow them on the membranes, they do, they increase in size and they seem to um, increase in, the, in maturity. And it takes around two days. If, it, if they've not done it by four days, it's unlikely that they are going to um, achieve a uh, mature size. So there's, there's quite a short uh, period of time for this to happen. And then what we've done is we've taken these oocytes um, from the, the membranes and then placed them in in vitro maturation media. 
and then after 24 hours we've imaged them. And this was, these images I'm showing you have all been carried out by uh, David Albertini. And you can see that we really get a mixed bag of, of lymphocytes. You get fragmentation, you get formation, maybe M1 starting to form spindles and fragmenting. But then, in a proportion of them, we can see metaphase through spindles um, forming and the um, production of a polar body. So this is happening from the primordial follicles that have been grown all the way to the point where we've matured them and we get them to metaphase two. Now, most you can see the polar bodies are quite large and that's something that we're working on and we think we've maybe cracked that. But that's a, a, a consequences of some of the culture conditions and the physical conditions. But more of that um, in, a, in a bit. So essentially we have this multi-step culture system starting with the uh, pieces of ovarian cortex that we prepare in such a way to promote activation of primordial follicles. We isolate the, um, uh, uh, the preantral follicles, we grow them individually, we get antral formation, remove the oocyte granulose cells, and then we get the oocytes to mature, and the next step, of course, is to test fertilization uh, potential. But if of all the oocytes that survive to the end, about 30% of them um, can complete that uh, system to metaphase two. So I'm just going to go uh, quickly on to um, looking at the oocytes from pre fertile girls, given that within the fertility preservation context, um, being able to apply this to pre fertile girls is probably the most important um, application. So we've published a study uh, looking at uh, a group of patients that came through um, fertility preservation, and this has been published, so I won't go into too many of the details. This is a publication here. Um, it was uh, published back in uh, 2013. And what happens with this tissue is, and this again is images from uh, David Albertini, this tissue is the most incredible tissue to work with. When you prepare small microcortex, it, you, you see lots of things happening. You see nerve cells forming, you see blood vessels forming, and you see local activation. So we divided up our groups into the girls that were um, pre-pubertal -pre and the ones who were just in puberty. So three to 10 years old and 12 to 15 years old. And we activated their follicles in vitro, and then we isolated their follicles and grew them within the step two that I've already described. And as you can see, there's a really significant difference in their capacity to develop in vitro. So these are the healthy adult women between 25 to 38 years old, and you can see their trajectory. 12 to 15, the, the follicles are being activated in vitro and then isolated. They don't grow so well as the um, adult women. And then the really young group, they're really not going well at all. So there's a significant difference in the capacity of the follicles isolated from the young tissue to grow in vitro. And that's a challenge now for us to develop the system to support their growth and development. So follicles can initiate growth at all ages to secondary stage. But the follicles from the younger girls grow slowly and they show little oocyte growth. Follicles from the adolescent girls grow more slowly than those from uh, women, but they show more growth than younger girls, so clearly an age-related effect. So we're now working on adapting that system to support the different um, uh, uh, types of follicles that, that, we, that we get. So we've looked at a range of varying tissues. We've looked at healthy women, we can get metaphase 2 from that tissue. We've looked at pre pubertal girls, and we're still only at multilamer ages. So that's working process. Uh, patients, so we've looked at, we've got some multilaminar, early antral. Chemotherapy treated tissue absolutely depends on the, the treatment. Some, nothing happens, and they all die, and in others, we can get development. But the gender reassignment patient, they become a really, really interesting model. 
because we can get med faith to most sites from them, albeit at a much lower rate than we can with the tissue um, from the, the women at the time of uh, caesarean section. And I'm just going to share some unpublished data from the Agenda Reassignment Group. And it's very preliminary data, but essentially, when we compare the growth development of the isolated follicles, so these have been activated in vitro, uh, these are the control tissue, and this is um, tissue from the gender reassignment patients, so be testosterone treated for a very number of years when, when we get them. And you can see that they grow much more slowly than the control tissue, but it's very it's still variable. And within that, some of the patients, we can isolate the follicles, we do get antral formation, and in at least two of the patients, We'll be able to get uh, med phase two oocytes, and they don't have large polar, polar bodies because we've changed the conditions, we've changed their oxygen tension, and we've changed uh, the substrate and how we actually cure them. So it's looking really positive that we can manipulate this process, and that this might actually help us in developing a system to support the uh, young uh, tissue as as well. So, of course, um, we can support the, the human oocyte growth, and it's a great model for human oocyte development because it really allows us to look at detailed questions about human oocyte development, of which we know very little. And our next big project is looking at the, the um, initiation of meiosis and, uh, and factors that will influence uh, the progression of meiosis. And of course, within the culture system, we're not claiming that it's a perfect system. It's absolutely not. We need to work on it. So we're working on improving the media, the adverbs, the disease, uh, the timings. Um, we're looking at developing a bioreactor type system that people in Italy in Naples have been working on. We're looking at our physical conditions to improve our polar body formation, and we think we're getting really close to being consistent with this and looking how it affects meiosis. And we're also comparing because in our system, a lot of the criticism is that it happens really quite fast. You're moving all of the inhibition. And so we're working with another group in Leeds, Helen Pickens group, who use a system where they uh, grow the whole follicle for a very long time and we're doing a comparison between this so-called fast growth versus the slow growth. So we have a lot that, that, that we're doing, and there's other groups around the world also working on these systems. But we hope to understand the health and the development of um, these intra-grown oocytes, sequencing the genome, the uh, metabolome, looking at all of these um, factors, fertilizing, of course, which we really want to have a, a better optimized system before we start with our, or we, we uh, go for the light and do fertilize. We don't want to start fertilization in you know, a very suboptimal system. And then, of course, embryo testing and have started is parallel studies on a large animal model in the sheep and cow. So we've used this multi step culture system um, uh, to, to study the effects of age, chemotherapy, the role of signaling pathways. And we've had many publications using this. And we're now using it to study the potential to generate neurocytes from putative germline stem cells, so complete in vitro gametogenesis. And that's, that's the subject of my presentation tomorrow morning at 8.30. So I'd like to um, acknowledge the people who actually do the work, the people in my lab. Um, these are uh, uh, postdocs in the lab. Marie McLaughlin has um, done most of the development of the culture system, and she's now um, working uh, with um, um, Merck. And uh, the other people are still in the lab and working on different aspects of the project. And these are people within the who had, uh, help us with many of the molecular aspects, the nurses who recruit the patients, 
And of course, Richard Anderson, Hamish Wallace, Adele Marston on our meiosis project, Helen Picton on our large animal project, and of course, David Albertini, who's been a long-term collaborator um, with uh, imaging uh, these, these follicles. And of course, the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome, who fund our projects, and the patients who kindly donate their tissue. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention, and thank you very much.